Representation matters. But as indigenous Chicano people, we can't just sit back and wait for mainstream media outlets to make it happen for us. And nor should we. We started the Tales from Aztlantis podcast because we believe that it is imperative for Chicanos, Chicanas, and Chicanex people to produce our own media and tell our own stories. And the way we choose to do this is by using Buzzsprout to host the podcast. Buzzsprout is by far the easiest and best way to launch a professional podcast. You'll get a podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and much more. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you and helps support the show. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Now, on with the show. You must excuse me. I've grown quite where I... This hasn't been easy, I know. But you've learned a lesson. A lesson in honesty. Honesty to yourself and honesty to others. That lesson will stand you in good stead all your life. I, I think we've all learned a good lesson. I've always heard that honesty is the best policy. Now I'm catching on to why that's so, why that's so, why that's so. Why that's so, why that's so Yali Nochime, so, and welcome to Tales from Aztlantis, the show where we explore Mesoamerican pseudo history, New Age nonsense, and other stories of adventure. We are your hosts, Curly Tlapoyawa and Ruben Arellano, also known as Tlacatecat. Episode 3 New Mexico has a Hispano white nationalist problem. When you hear the phrase white nationalist, the sad image of an angry young skinhead toting a Nazi flag and snapping out the fascist salute may come to mind. But here in New Mexico, we have a brand of white nationalism rooted in Hispano identity. And while the people promoting this ideology may look very different from the angry skinhead, their objectives are no less dangerous. So what is a Hispano white nationalist, you might ask? The ideology that drives Hispano white nationalism is rooted in the false historical narrative that New Mexicans are directly descended from Spanish conquistadors and that New Mexico has a unique, distinctly Spanish, not Mexican cultural inheritance. Those that promote this confused ideology will recoil in disgust at the very idea of being called a Mexican and will be quick to respond to such an accusation with, I'm not a Mexican, I'm Spanish. Of course, this is ridiculous, but ideologies based on racial fantasy seldom make sense. You see, New Mexico's Hispanos view themselves as white Spaniards who just so happen to mix a little bit with indigenous people, not as a mixed blood indigenous people who maintain cultural practices rooted on this continent for thousands of years. The distinction is important as Hispano identity is firmly rooted in whiteness, while Chicano identity as an, is an open declaration of indigenous pride. In other words, one identity prioritizes a European worldview while the other celebrates an indigenous cultural inheritance. And while Hispanos may pay lip service to this indigenous ancestry by claiming to be mestizo or mixed blood, it always comes from a position of whiteness and almost always as an excuse for their racism against New Mexico's indigenous people. Well, how can I be racist? My great grandmother was a Pueblo Indian, you'll often hear. A perfect example of this twisted ideology can be found in the following Facebook post. We, the descendants of our Spanish immigrant ancestors, are not sorry for exploring the new world, stopping the Aztec practice of human sacrifice, bringing the horse, cattle, sheep for wool, oranges, grapes, wine, and arid farming techniques, etc. 
stopping slavery from being allowed in territories we controlled, loving the indigenous natives of the Americas enough to marry and have children with them that led to our shared Spanish, Mexican, and Mestizo Indio culture. <laughs> what a bunch of horseshit. <laughs> Hispanos position themselves as white Spaniards first and foremost, and see the brutal conquest of Mesoamerica and the American Southwest as completely justified. Sure, the Spanish raped, enslaved, and murdered people, but hey, now you have wine. Some will even go so far as to deny that the Spanish committed any atrocities against indigenous people at all, and that such claims are lies meant to disparage their ancestors. The stark similarities to Holocaust denial should not sit well with anyone. Recently, two prominent statues of Juan de Oñate, a Spaniard who was found guilty of acts of brutality against the Acoma people, and exiled for life from New Mexico were taken down after much protest. This enraged New Mexico's Hispano community who saw this as a direct assault on their European heritage. And while a final decision has yet to be made regarding the fate of these statues as of this recording, Hispanos are demanding that they are erected once again. So how did New Mexico get to this point? What prompted Nuevo Mexicanos to reject their mixed blood indigenous heritage and embrace an identity based on a European self-image? The answer lies in a racial fantasy concocted shortly after the U.S.-Mexican War. When the United States forcefully acquired the modern Southwest from Mexico, the newly taken land came with the people who lived on it, lots of them. Overnight, Mexican citizens of mixed indigenous blood, along with Pueblo and Plains people who had lived in the Southwest for millennia, were placed in a state of limbo. America now had a Mexican problem. In the years following the war, Mexican Americans were commonly referred to as half-breeds and mongrels by an Anglo-operated press that viewed them as the enemy. As historian Mark Reisler has pointed out, the perception of Mexican Americans in the American mindset stressed a dual theme. The Mexicans' Indian blood would pollute the nation's genetic purity and his biologically determined degenerate character traits would sap the country's moral fiber and corrupt its institutions. In an attempt to overcome their status as half-breed Indians, Nuevo Mexicanos rejected their indigenous heritage outright and the image of the noble Spanish explorer was elevated as the source of their identity. By glorifying Spanish colonialism and adopting a Spanish American, i.e. white European view of themselves, New Mexico's mixed blood indigenous inhabitants were allowed to redeem their ethnicity by recasting themselves from dirty, disreputable Mexican Indians into noble Spanish explorers. This transformation from racially inferior half-breed Indians to Spanish elites helped assuage Anglo hostility towards New Mexico's mixed blood character, and New Mexico was eventually granted statehood in 1912. As historian Charles Montgomery observed, Spanish American took root in New Mexico only because of the territory's unusual balance of power. The term became embedded in everyday conversation only because it served the interests of both Anglo and Spanish-speaking leaders to propagate it, to spread it from newspaper editorials, to party conventions, to political meetings of the smallest towns. What made the term so popular was its malleability. In the eyes of Spanish-speaking politicians, and newspaper editors, Spanish-American evoked both a proud Spanish colonial past and an elusive American future, a future in which they might still realize the promise of equality amid Anglo intolerance. Of course, this did not completely eliminate Anglo's perceptions of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans as an indigenous threat to the American way of life. While discussing the Mexican problem for the Journal of Foreign Affairs, 
Nativist author Glenn Hoover said the following. More Indians have crossed the southern border in one year than lived in the entire territory of New England at the time of Plymouth Settlement. This movement is the greatest Indian migration of all time. (laughs) Such attitudes prompted the freshly minted Hispanos of New Mexico to deny their indigenous blood even more vigorously and to demand that they be viewed as white. At a rally held in the town of Las Vegas, New Mexico, in response to a newspaper article, poet Usabio Chacon declared, The sense of said article is that we Spanish Americans are a dirty, ignorant, and degraded people, a mix of Indians and Spaniards. I am a Spanish American, like the rest of you who listen to me. No blood runs through my veins other than the Don Juan de Oñate brought, and the one later brought by the illustrious ancestors of my name. This level of self-hatred and erasure of one's own indigenous past in exchange for white privilege is both heartbreaking and tragic, especially when you consider that Oñate's wife was of Aztec or Mexica nobility, and his son was the great-great-grandson of Motecuzoma Xocoyotzin. This call for white Hispano identity was echoed by politician Antonio Lucero, who in 1915 stated, Spanish Americans belong to the Caucasian race. If there is a trace of the Indian among us, it is so slight and so rare as to prove the exception rather than the rule. We are not only Caucasians, but we belong to that branch of the white race, the Aryan, which more than all other has made the history of the world. Ours is a past that can take its place in that grand procession of greatness that is no more. A past to be admired, honored, and reverenced. Again, a douchebag. Sadly, in their struggle to be viewed as equals by Anglo newcomers, the Hispanos of New Mexico were robbed of their true ancestry a rich heritage of Pueblo, Plains, and Mesoamerican cultural inheritance was wiped clean, even if in name only, and replaced by a racial fantasy deeply ingrained in the minds of many Nuevo Mexicanos and reinforced through years of pseudo-historical indoctrination. It's time to do away with this harmful, hateful racial myth. So when I first moved um, to New Mexico, so my family was part of the group that helped settle New Mexico. Um, They arrived as reinforcements to Oñate's colony. And my ancestors that arrived were heavily mixed, heavily like straight up Mexicas and Tlaxcaltecas from central Mexico right, who mixed with quote-unquote Spaniards who by that time were already mixed blood themselves. So they arrive, you know, and that's how my family got here. And then my family eventually moved up to Southern Colorado where I was born. But when we moved, essentially we moved back, I remember distinctly, man, I was waiting for the bus with this other kid. It was just the two of us. We were waiting for the bus to go to school. And the kid asked me what my name was. And he's like, oh, uh, what is that? What are you? I said, oh, I'm I'm a Chicano. I'm I'm Mexican. And this kid looked at me with this, I'm, I'm not shitting you, this look of disdain and horror. Was this in uh, Pueblo? No, this was here. This is when we moved moved here to New Mexico. This was like one of my first experiences going to school. And, uh, I I didn't know how to take it. Right. Like I grew up a child of the Chicano movement. Like this was something I was very fiercely proud of. Well, you know, the Chicano movement also existed in Albuquerque. So that's kind of strange. Yeah. Right. Big time. It was, it was big here. So it is weird. And I remember him saying, well, well, my name, and I don't even remember his name. And he's like, well, my name is such and such some Spanish name. And he's like, it's Spanish. 
not Mexican. And I was like, that's really weird, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, growing up uh, as a teenager, I mean, I used to love going to the library, my interest in history and, you know, trying to research my, my ancestry, my culture, et cetera. Uh, growing up here in Dallas, um, you know, led me to a lot of uh, interesting materials, reading materials about, you know, not only just Mexico, but like, you know, that's what introduced me to the Chicano movement, you know, the history of it. And I remember like reading about the Hispanos. And I think the first time that I ever read about that was in Acuna's book, um, Occupied America. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, you know, the, this idea of the fantasy Spanish heritage. So early on, like I was aware of it, but, you know, living in Dallas, like I had no context as to like what that really meant. It wasn't until I went to the army. I was active duty for three years and in the army, I met a guy who was from, I think he was from Bernalillo. Uh, I mean, I, I distinctly remember him telling us that he was, uh, his last name was Castillo too. And then, you know, in, in the army, a lot of people don't know this, but maybe it's changed now over the years. This was back in the late nineties. And uh, it was very cliquish, you know, all the raza stuck together, all the Chicanos and Mexicanos. All the Boricuas stuck together, all the African Americans and you know the whites. I mean, you had some intermixture here and there, but for the most part, it was very cliquish. And I remember this dude, you know, we were we were hitting him up, you know, like, hey, what's up? Because you know, he was new and like we wanted to know who he was and his background. And he seemed a little bit kind of like standoffish, you know, mm -hmm. and because we were very proud back then, it was very common to see a lot of Raza with waving Mexican flags, and you remember that. Yeah, back in the day, right? It's not as common as it used to be, at least in, in some parts. And uh, this dude was sort of like w uh, baffled, I guess, at this notion that we would be so proud to wave Mexican <laughs> flags and we were in the army. And then when when I asked him, "Hey, well, where are you from?" He was like, "Oh, I'm from New Mexico." Oh, really? What part? Um, I think he said Bernalillo. And I said, "All right." And he's like, "But," what? and then he asked me, "Why? Why do y'all call yourselves Mexican?" aren't y'all Spanish like me? I'm like, <laughs> I was like, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute. What happened there? <laughs> and so he never, I mean, we would try to include this dude in, into our group, but he just never really like hit it off with us. Cause he was, it was like the sad trombone from the prices. Right. Man. <laughs> it was really weird. You know, it's like, dude, get with it, man. So that was my first introduction to, this whole Hispano identity from, you know, in a real like sense of knowing someone, not just reading it in a book. Yeah, it's a trip. And, you know, like, like we just covered, you know, it, it happened for a reason. There was a historic reason why they adopted this identity and this uh, fictional narrative, right? This uh, racial fiction that they constructed to try to be, to try to survive, right? To try to be yeah. accepted by the, the Anglos, the, the Americans. And okay, whatever, I get it, you know? Now, I'm not gonna judge these people for what they felt they had to do. Survival, you know? to, to survive, although some of these quotes were pretty ridiculous. Like the guy that was like, we're Aryans. <laughs> Wait, what date was that from? When 1915. 1915. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but I mean, it's it's 2021. We don't have to cling to this fantasy anymore, but it's so deeply embedded in this state. Like, and it's reinforced through the schools. It's reinforced in the educational system. I never learned anything about like the legit influence that Mesoamerica had on the state of New Mexico until I was in college and just That's really sad diving into it like if when i was in school if somebody had told me in junior high in history class you know on a cold winter morning 2000 mexica and flashcalteca warriors squared off against pueblo warriors on the west side of albuquerque of what will become albuquerque that would have blown my mind that would have made me so interested in the history of this place you know when you consider that the name of the state that I live in, New Mexico, it has a Nahuatl name. The name of the state is in Nahuatl. The two oldest neighborhoods, the two oldest barrios, 
colonial barrios in New Mexico have Nahuatl names, Atlixco and Analco. And this is just erased, you know? It's, it's well, I mean, ignored. you can still go to those places and, and see plaques. I mean, we've been there and taken pictures. Yeah, yeah, but it's not promoted, you know? It's like, if you didn't know that was there, you wouldn't learn about it in school. That's for sure. Yeah. It's not well, common knowledge. What is, what is it? I mean, because it's been my understanding for a long time as well that a lot of people from... Um, southern Colorado because before it was Colorado it was still part of the New Mexico territory and so a lot of those older um, settlements the original ones before the Anglos came in were part of that home New Mexico tradition so wasn't some of that sort of Hispano identity found in places like southern Colorado as well? You know it could have been I don't re- honestly man, I don't remember it because like I said I grew up in the Chicano movement so my parent, you know, my, my mom and my uncles and my grandma, and my grandpa and my, you know, aunts and cousins, none of us were using that word. We were all calling ourselves Chicanos. So that's interesting. It's nothing, you know, even my grandma called herself a Chicana, you know, wow. so. And, you know, I've done, I mean, maybe at some point, not in this episode, but, you know, we're, we need to explore the the term Chicano, right? Because there's a lot of ideas as to oh, where yeah, it comes sure. from. And, and but one of the things that I, I mean, one of the ideas that I have uh, encountered in my research, I believe that it's been a while since I looked at this, I believe it was um, Luis, was it Luis Leal, I believe, who did a paper in the late 1970s, where he was doing a, sort of a linguistic um analysis of the term but not based on the, the one that we have come to know as far as you know stemming from mexica mexicano chicano right mm-hmm. like that's that's kind of like the standard uh, yeah um way that people understand the origin of the term he was saying that it, it was a little bit more mundane than that he was saying that it was a term that was uh sort of shortened from mexicano when it was anglicized in the u.s by anglos sort of using it as a as a way to demean to to demean mexican people especially uh people who were uh, recent immigrants and instead of calling them instead of calling them mexicanos or mexicanos they would call them chicanos chicanos you know so it just over time the word slowly was um contracted from Mm -hmm. mexicano mexicano to chicano and so that's one way of understanding so there's different ways of, of looking at the term mm-hmm. and and but what i'm trying to get at with this is that his research led him to conclude that the term chicano originated somewhere along the border but like near like el paso and into the new mexico area and then it spread from there to texas and to california and other parts of the southwest so it has it has a new mexican origin at least hmm. one of the interpretations of the word chicano and so but that that would be the southern part of new mexico not the northern part yeah so then you also have that sort of dichotomy between the way that people in southern new mexico perceive themselves in terms of identity as opposed to people from northern new mexico when those older established uh colonial settlements yeah for sure I mean, when they were um, taking these statues down, you know, you had a lot of these older Hispanos just up in arms, freaking out about it. And in Española, they had a um, a big, uh, like, entrada that they would celebrate, uh, Juan de Oñate. And the, the city did away with it. Like, they did away with an official, you know, sponsorship of this event and just you know, whatever, if you guys want to do it, do it as a private event, but the city's no longer going to be part of this. And I actually went up to, uh, to observe the, uh, the city council meeting where this was decided. And I shit you not, man, there were guys there dressed as Spaniards. (laughs) You mean like in the get up with the whole knights and like armor and no, like the, um, like the frill and the fringe, uh, like blouses, like the loose fitting oh, right. blouses. Mid- mid- medieval the... commoners or something. Yeah. 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 They were like, they like, were... like they were cosplaying, uh, the Renaissance fair or something. Oh man. Total, total <laughs> cosplay. You know, like I, I had made a, so around the same time, it's funny you mentioned that around the same time I created a meme 
and I took a photo of one of these guys dressed like a conquistador on his horse. And uh, the meme said something like, you know, when you don't know your history, you cosplay as white people. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Uh. It's just a trip, you know, because it's, I'm seeing, well, I was for a while seeing less and less of it until the Onyate thing came and it kind of like gave it a resurgence. Of, right. Because with, with genetics and all, I mean, have, hasn't some of that uh, Hispano identity been retracted a little bit by some of these earlier, maybe not like loud proponents of it, but just ordinary people who just didn't think twice about it. They just understood who they were as Hispanos and now after doing, you know, DNA testing and uh, Ancestry.com and that sort of stuff, like the results come back and it shows that they have a, a significant amount of indigenous ancestry. And they're yeah, and not out. only that, but their their family records trace them back to Mexico and they have indigenous ancestry from Mexico, right? So it's blowing a lot of people's minds, you know, and it's good to see. So it's... The DNA, you know, people criticize the, you know, DNA testing, whether that's a measure of identity, blah, blah, blah. But as, as far as I'm concerned, it's doing a good job in New Mexico of helping to expose this myth that mm -hmm. the people here are like pure Spanish right. or, you know, overwhelming. Because I always tell these guys, like, look, even genetically, you know, genetics doesn't matter as much as your cultural inheritance, mm -hmm. right? What was the culture that your grandma passed down to you or your grandpa? Like, what did you grow up doing that was intrinsically part of your being? And I grew up here and I could tell you, man, I don't know the first fucking thing about Spain. You know, <laughs> like, I don't know what Spanish is. I don't I don't know the first thing about being Spanish. I'm a oh, Chicano. <laughs> I didn't grow up eating paella or, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Tortillas. <laughs> You know, those Spanish tortillas. Made yeah, the eggs. Spanish tortillas and tamales and pozole, and, you know, all that Spanish stuff. So it's like we have this culture that is richly indigenous and it's like, nah, that's not good enough. But you know what, what's also weird about this whole Hispanic or Hispano fantasy heritage is that it's based on uh, stories like these fictional stories that were written by I forget uh, the name of this woman. There's there was there was several of them, but there's one that's credited for starting kickstarting the whole thing at the turn of the century and the 19th century into the 20th. And these were white ladies that were writing. They were romanticizing the Southwest. They were romanticizing <laughs> California and New Mexico, and and they would you know do these you know hot novels that you know for their time yeah. about these. Uh, you know, Latin lover type, you know, the, the Spanish uh, conquistador descendant, you know, Hidalgos and whatnot. Yeah. And that's where the whole, whole Hispanic or Hispano fantasy heritage comes from. It was invented by white women writing about hot Mexicans. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember it wasn't too long ago. I forget who did the story, but there was a, a newspaper article or maybe it was a tv uh sequence but they were talking about how mexican food became spanish food in the southwest do you, right. do you remember that yeah it's and spanish how it was, rice and yeah and it was like a, really a direct mexican. reaction to anti-mexican racism because all these mexican restaurants had to change and say, oh no we're spanish restaurants this is spanish food and it kind of right you know, it made it more presentable. It made it right. okay, you know. Well, at least they're not Mexicans. At least yeah, they're not, at least they're not Mexican. Mexican. They're Spanish. We still don't like the Spanish because they're kind of mongrelly too, but yeah. they're, <laughs> they're a little bit more acceptable. Yeah, at least they're European. Yeah. That is uh, pretty much uh, 2021 right there. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. What's what's so gross, especially right now, man, to have that that level of infighting, that level of criticism when we just we've just come out of four years of one of the worst possible situations for indigenous people. Right. You know, especially indigenous people from south of the border who were demonized 
and dehumanized and infantilized by this shitbag of a former president. And we should be united, forming yeah, coalitions. <laughs> I hear a lot about this word call, called allies. Something. I mean, so the only allies are the ones that think like me? I mean, I guess I, so. That's not what an ally is. <clears throat> you don't, you, you know, don't pass the ideological purity test. So we're exactly. not going to uh, recognize gonna, you as an ally. That's going to do us in, in the end. This, well, I mean, yeah, that's you, basically what happened with the Chicano movement. A lot of infighting, a lot of yes. political... Uh, yeah, you had legitimate grievances like a lot of the, the Chicanas and with the Chicano feminism and a lot of the LGBTQ people who were also, you know, you know, wanting to be represented. But beyond that, I mean, you had a lot of uh, political infighting, a lot of backstabbing, a lot of... Uh, criticize, instead of criticizing to make the movement better it was it was criticized into oblivion by yeah. the end of the 70s you know the chicano movement is pretty much defunct at that point and yeah. because of all the i mean i'm not saying that it was all because but it, it played a huge role in the reason why the chicano movement failed to really you know accomplish a lot of the goals that that a lot of people set out to do whether it was individually or within groups because there was just too much too much differences, too many ideological differences, and and I fear that in today's age we haven't learned that lesson from those yeah. old generations, we and we keep own. sort of repeating the same cycles over and over. And it's like I tell my students in, in, my, in my classes that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. You know, that's why we're in history class. That's what I teach. I'm a history professor, and that's why we're here to to learn history. Not so that we don't repeat it, you know, the old cliche of repeating the history, but so that we can learn from the past and do better in the future, in the now, right? And I don't think that we've really learned a lot of those lessons, especially if we're talking about like civil rights and progressive issues. We keep fighting the same issues all over again in different forms, but it's basically the same thing. I mean, if, if you synthesize it to the very core of what, what's being um, demanded what's being fought for, whether it's police justice, immigration, uh, unity among different ethnicities, uh, respecting people who have different opinions, respecting people for, for who they are. We're still fighting the same issues that we were fighting 50, 60 years ago. I don't know. I mean, something's got to give, bro. Thank you for listening to Tales from Atlantis. We will see you again next episode. But until then, remember, the truth is like medicine. It doesn't always taste good, but it's always good for you. I'm your host, Curly Tlapoyawa. And I'm Ruben Ariano. And we'll see you next time. Timo Itase. Thank you for listening to Tales from Atlantis, a project of the Chimali Institute of Mesoamerican Arts. If you enjoy the show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You can do this by visiting talesfromastlantis.com and clicking support the podcast. Your continued support will help keep the podcast ad-free and independent. Until next time, Timo Itase.